So first, uh, to make sense out of this, you need to get the order of operations right. So remember, you have to do the multiplications before you do any additions or subtractions. So uh, first, I'm going to multiply 4 times 6 is 24. 4 times negative 3.5 is negative 14. And then I'm going to think of this as adding negative 2.5 times negative 2 and 1. Um, so plus positive 5, negative 2.5. And you get an answer of 29, negative 16.5. Um, and the magnitude, so the magnitude of 29, negative 16.5 is 29 squared plus negative 16.5 squared square root. And what do you get from that? I didn't do this, so someone has a, okay, 33.37. So the magnitude has to be bigger than either of those two components. Just like the diagonal of a right triangle has to be longer than either of the two legs. Okay. Um, so what do you think? Well, I guess that's what I just said. So if you so when you take the magnitude of that resultant vector, it always has to be bigger than the magnitudes of the two vectors that are going into it, the two components. Okay. So uh, this is how you do the math. Oh, no, I want to say one more thing before I go into that. So notice one thing about this. Um, these definitions of addition of vectors and multiplication um, mean that you can break up any calculation into an x component calculation and a separate y component calculation. Like you could imagine some crazy definition of vector addition where this wouldn't be the case. They'd be all, the meaning would be all mixed up with the y components and the x components. But um, the way we have it, it's nice and clean. The x component of the resultant only depends on the x components of what's going into it. The y component only depends on the y components of what's going into it. And so the effect of that is you can, you can, you know, any vector calculation, you can break up into x stuff and y stuff. And so that means that we're often going to do calculations where the fact that we're dealing with vectors is a little bit obscured, you know? We won't be writing stuff as vector equations. Um, and that's just because we have this ability with these definitions of addition and multiplication to break it up into x and y. OK. Um, so for example, uh, you can think of this. Um, calculation that we just did in that example problem as a separate calculation of 4 times 6 minus 
2.5 times negative 2 was equal to 29. And separately, 4 times negative 3.5 minus 2.5 times 1 was negative 16.5. Okay. So now let's go on to the physical meaning of adding vectors and multiplying vectors because you know it's when you're dealing with the components it's easy to do the calculation but you don't have really a physical sense of what's going on so this is the physical meaning of adding vectors and multiplying vectors by a scalar Um, so first, adding two vectors the meaning is um, put the tail of one vector at the head of the other vector And then the resultant vector is the vector going from the free tail to the free head. So, um, That doesn't make any sense until I give you an example. Um, so let's say that we want to add this vector to this vector. OK. It doesn't matter which one you, you know, which tail you put at the head of which one. The order doesn't matter. But um, so that's this one. Now I'm going to take the tail of the other one and put it at the head of this one. OK, then the resultant vector is the vector that goes from the free tail. So um, both of these two vectors have tails, right? One has something there, one doesn't. The one that doesn't have anything there is the free tail. So the resultant vector goes from the free tail to the free head. I was off a little on my alignment, but you know what I mean. And um, if you did the calculation using vector components, like you had these two expressed in vector components, you did that addition using components, the components you got would represent this vector. Okay. And uh, second, the meaning of multiplying a vector by a scalar. I'm going to break this up into two separate pieces. I'm going to tell you the physical meaning of multiplying a vector by a positive scalar. And then I'm going to tell you the meaning of multiplying a vector times the scalar negative 1. Okay? Because uh, you can think of multiplying by any negative number as just a combination of those two things. Multiplying by, so multiplying something by negative 50 is you can think of it as first multiplying it by negative 1 and then multiplying it by positive 50. OK. So uh, first, to multiply 
a vector by a positive scalar. just multiplies the magnitude by that scalar. So for example, multiplying the scalar 3 to a vector like that, just takes that vector, its direction stays the same, but now it's going to be three times as long. So that's the resultant vector. And then B, multiplying a vector by negative 1, just it keeps the magnitude the same, but makes the direction opposite. So, for example, negative 1 times this vector gives you this vector. So you can put those two things together. Um, if you want to multiply by a negative number that's not negative 1. Um, negative 4 times this vector is this vector. The opposite direction and 4 times as long. Vectors don't have any starting point on their own. Oh, okay. They just have the direction and magnitude. So um, the only time you, you associate a vector with the origin is, is uh, when you put it there to figure out the angle and figure out the components. But you can think of it as just sort of naturally floating in space. Um, So the last thing I want to talk about is um, choosing a coordinate system. Um, so if you go back to the um, calculations of how to come up with vector components, from a vector, it depends on what your coordinate system is. Um, so say that you have a vector like this that makes an angle of 55 degrees below the horizontal. And let's say that it has a length of 8.5. Um, What are the components of that vector 
in a coordinate system like the standard coordinate system that we're used to? Well, to do that calculation, we'd put the tail of that vector at the origin of this coordinate system, take the counterclockwise angle um, from the positive x-axis to the vector. Uh, so that would be 360 minus 55, or you could just call it negative 55 and do the clockwise angle. So you'd get components of 8.5 times the cosine of 305 and the y component 8.5 times the sine of 305 and you get a value of 4.875 negative 6.963. And now I'm going to do the same calculation for the same vector. What are the components in a coordinate system uh, oriented, let's say, with the, let me do it with the x-axis down and the y-axis this way. So in this case, you, um, the vector itself doesn't rotate, but you put its tail at the origin of this coordinate system. You know that this angle is 55 degrees, but what you want to come up with the components is the counterclockwise angle from the positive x-axis, which is now pointing down. So what's the counterclockwise angle from the positive x-axis to this vector? I drew my angle really badly, so it doesn't look like it's right. But it's so it's going to be 90 minus 55, so 35 degrees. So the components are 8.5 times the cosine of 35 degrees, 8.5 times the sine of 35 degrees. And the values you get are, I guess they are going to be um, 6.9634.875. Yep. Um, so, uh, that is a good lead in to, so I'm going to give you some rules. There are going to be problems where you have to choose your coordinate system and there are really just two rules you have to follow. And one of those explains that. Any other questions on this? Um, I want you to keep in mind that choosing your coordinate system, actually choosing your coordinate system orientation, is the 2D equivalent of choosing your positive direction in 1D. And we haven't talked about this yet, but it seems like a good place to write this. Uh, choosing your coordinate system origin is the 2D equivalent of choosing your zero position in 1D.
Okay, so if we're going to have the flexibility, you know, like with every problem, we had to choose, in 1D problems, we had to choose a positive direction and we had to choose a zero position. Those were things that we had freedom to choose. If we're going to have that freedom to choose coordinate system orientations, we need to know what the rules are, you know, what limits there are to what we can specify. So here are the rules for specifying coordinate system orientations. The first one is that the x and y axes have to be perpendicular. And the second one is that um, let's say acceptable coordinate systems are rotated versions. of the standard coordinate system that you're used to. No flipping. Okay, so for example, um, this is allowed because you can imagine if, if you had like a hinge at the origin of this coordinate system, you could get into this orientation by just rotating those counterclockwise. And this is also allowed. But this and this are not allowed because no matter how you rotate this standard or uh, you know standard coordinate system that you're used to you can't have you can't get to this the only way you could have that is you could picture this standard one being a transparency and flipping it over onto its back and then you could rotate it into these orientations okay so these are not allowed And that's why, in answer to your question about the, uh, you know, why wasn't the positive x-axis pointing up here? It's because if you have the y-axis pointing this way, the x-axis pointing up requires flipping it, and that's not allowed. Okay. All right. Any questions? The last one? Yes. 